Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for another poetry discussion, a poetry discussion which will appear in two separate playlists here on the channel. Number one, obviously, being the poetry discussion playlist, but number two, we are going poem by poem through Sylvia Plath in the Little Yellow Book. Sylvia Plath, uh, the collected poems edited with an introduction by <gasps> Ted Hughes. So, we are here for the third video in that playlist, as well as 240th or so video in the poetry discussion playlist. So what do we have here today? We have a poem titled Pursuit, and it reads as such. Dans le fond de forte votre im image me suit. Racing, I am, uh, if you couldn't tell, uh, fluent in italian here so that is what it is and the poem reads as such there is a panther stalks me down one day i'll have my death of him his greed has set the woods aflame he prowls me lordly than the sun more lordly than the sun most soft most suavely glides that step advancing always at my back from gaunt hemlock rooks croak havoc the hunt is on and sprung the trap flayed by thorns i trek the rocks haggard through the hot white noon a long red network of his veins what fires run what craving wakes insatiate he ransacks the land condemned by our ancestral fault crying blood let blood be spilt meat must glut his mouth's raw sat raw wound keen the rending teeth and sweet the singeing fury of his fur his kisses parch each paws a briar doom consummates that appetite in the wake of this fierce cat kindled like torches for his joy charred and ravened women lie becoming his starving body's bait. Now hills hatch menace, spawning shade, midnight cloaks the sultry grove, the black marauder hauled by love on fluent haunches keeps my, my speed, behind snarled thickets of my eyes lurks the lithe one in dreams ambush, bright those claws that mar the flesh, and hungry, hungry those taut thighs, his ardor snares me, light the trees, and I run flaring in my skin. What a lull, what lull, what cool can lap me in, when burns and brands that yellow gaze. I hurl my heart to halt the, his pace, to quench his thirst I squander bluke. He eats, and still his need seeks food, compels a total sacrifice. His voice waylays me, spells a trance. The gutted forest falls to ash, appalled by secret want. I rush from such assault of radiance, entering the tower of my fears. I shut my doors on that dark guilt. I bolt the door, each door I bolt. Blood quickens, gonging in my ears. The panther's tread is on the stairs, coming up and up the stairs. So this is the uh, third video in the Sylvia Plath discussion playlist, and I have said time and again, and I stand by this, that I don't think other poems are necessary to understanding a poem. Everything that is necessary to understand literature lies in the literature and in you. That is all you need in order to have your take thereof. However, there are a few other things that help us with this poem. Number one, we have here again, rooks. We have here again, stalks. We have discussed now three Sylvia Plath poems, and all three have these two distinct words. We're not counting the, we're not counting he or she, we're not counting a, we're not counting of. These, these two words, stalks and rooks, are popping up time and again in uh, Sylvia Plath's poetry. So much like bees in 
Emily Dickinson, much like death personified in Emily Dickinson. We have to wonder what these things mean to the writer. These things to the author mean some thing. And there's another thing that we have had time and again. We had it um, in the previous poem, Winter Landscape. We have this dichotomy of light versus dark. In Winter Landscape with Rooks, it was the Rooks versus the Swan. Now, we are only, are we assuming the Swan was white? Because otherwise it would have been noted, or is the uh, Swan called out as white? This, the swan is not called out as white. There are black swans, but black swans are rare. So you would notice if a, if a swan was black, uh, and therefore you would call it out in that fashion, right? So if it is not otherwise denoted, we assume the swan is white. So in other Sylvia Plath poems, in the the poem directly prior to this, Winter Landscape with Rooks, we have that dichotomy of the two different characters, the rook, black, the swan, white. Here, we have only, we have only the nature itself being white. If I can find it here, hot, white, noon. So only the nature here is white. All of the other characters, the rooks, the briefly mentioned ravens. Where, where that? Well, I don't know why I. There's briefly mentioned ravens, but they are women who have been ravened, charred, ravened. Women lie. Uh, this is black. This is darkness. Uh, only the nature itself is white, because the panther is black. The rooks. Are we going to do this? I guess we'll do it half and half. Are black. So we have a lot of darkness going on here. So that the, even this singeing fury, right? All of these things are dark, are black. Leaving only the nature itself to be light. Leaving only nature itself to be virginal. Leaving only nature itself to be pure. Anything that is moving, anything that is acting, either either is or becomes dark, becomes corrupted. So those are what are going on. But another thing here that we have to take note of, like I said, I don't think that it is necessary to bring any other poem into a poem in order to understand it. Uh, I don't think that it's necessary to bring any other literature into literature to have a personal take on it. But one thing that will often help us in deciphering things is to bring in other texts. And here we seem to have a, this poem of a ghastly type of love seems to itself be a love letter to another poem, a poem that comes to us from William Blake. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what, dare, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp? Dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who make the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So we have not only, oh, went too far. Gone too far, that's what they say. We have not only the occurrence of the panther 
which is not a tiger, but is a predatory cat. We have the Woods of Flame. We have this as well. What's a weird... Why is it... Okay, that's fine. We have all of these different things that seem to call back to the William Blake poem. And um, why would, why would uh, Sylvia Plath do that? Well, oftentimes, artists will commemorate something through a work of their own. Oftentimes, early writers, beginning writers, will try on other people's voices. But I don't think it is either of those things here. We, uh, where is that one part here? We have the... Uh, we have things being, bolt the door. Each door I bolt. We have all of these things going on here. So that is repetition. What the hand, what the shoulder. All of these different things that sort of are reminiscent of the William Blake poem. And I don't think, I, I don't, obviously I don't think they're on accident. I don't think that they are necessarily a tribute to William Blake. I think that the commentary being made here by Sylvia Plath, by our speaker, is that the panther in question, um, the anther in question, the panther in question is not simply faulty of his own. The panther in question is f naughty by nature. The panther in question is created this way. The panther in question seems not to know. The panther in question himself is someone else's blame. In Tiger, Tiger, in, in The Tiger by William Blake, the speaker questions whether or not a divine god could have created something so merciless as the tiger. How could that be? However could that have come? With pursuit, I think we have Sylvia Plath asking the same type of question. I think that is from whence these references spring. The question itself being, how could a gracious God have created something so merciless? Something so merciless as to Kindled like torches for his joy, charred and ravened women lie, become his starving body's bait. How could, how could a merciful God have created something so merciless? Is that possible? How could these things be? We have a, a speaker in this poem who is desperate for escape on some level. On some level. After all, we end the poem, the panther's tread is on the stairs, coming up and up the stairs. But where is, in this poem, the desire, and this is going to sound, this is going to sound stupid. This is going to sound very stupid when I say it. Where is the desire for escape? There's running, but the poem itself is titled Pursuit. The poem itself is not titled The Kill. The poem itself is not titled Anything to Do with Getting Away. The poem itself is titled With the Act of the Hunt. And oftentimes, when we find ourselves in a terrible type of love. It feels that way, doesn't it? It all feels like chasing and being chased. It all feels as if there is some great quagmire in the way, some 
great inability to simply say to ourselves, look, just get out. Just get out. We can't do it. We can feel ourselves running. We can feel ourselves becoming the victim. We can feel ourselves succumbing to whatever this terrible lover wants. We can feel ourselves inside that lover's eyes, the pursued, all of these things. But we do not feel as if we could ever truly escape the situation. Is that what is being communicated by our writer, by our speaker? On some level, I think, yes, we have, you know, I, again, I don't believe that the, I don't believe that the biography is necessary here. I think only the personal experience is necessary here to understand this type of poem. However, we do have both. Probably we have both. We have at least the biography, but most of us have been in this type of situation, I believe. And armed with both, we can sort of see it, can't we? We can sort of see the speaker's inability to escape. Ability to run. Ability to be torn up. Ability to be pursued. But does our speaker have the ability to truly escape? That is all I have for this poetry discussion, the third in a 274-part series journeying poem by poem through Sylvia Plath, but also around the 240th, I believe, poetry discussion in the poetry discussion playlist. If you enjoy what I do, hitting the like button really helps me out on the channel. It tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And if you find yourself here by chance but not design, literature is the only thing I do on this channel. Um, poetry every Monday. There's poetry discussions, there are short stories, there are novel read-alongs, a little bit of writing stuff mixed in, so uh, I hope to have you back for the next one.